In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This past week, I went on a short but long road trip. We drove to Virginia to visit my birth mother and many cousins. I keep meeting more cousins. Poor Susan keeps meeting my relatives. She thinks she's done, and then there's always more somehow. And then we went to D.C. and visited with our daughter briefly for the day, and then I dropped Susan off at the General Convention of the Episcopal Church in Baltimore. For most of this trip, I've been schlepping a canoe on top of the van, a canoe that my birth mother wanted to give us. It's been sitting in her garage for 20 years. It was her late husband's, um, and no one was using it, and she really wanted us to have it. So I've been going all over the country with this uh, canoe, and that's wonderful. It fit beautifully on top of the van. The problem is where to put it in the house, because our small two-car garage already has two kayaks, and the only place I could think of was to hang this canoe from the ceiling of the garage. Why am I saying all that? I was thinking about Amos and that plumb line, because instead of a plumb line, I had a tape measure. Would this canoe fit? Yes, it would just fit in this space, and I think I can so I looked on, you know, you learn everything from YouTube. So I figured out how to get a pulley system, and I went to the hardware store, and I got the hooks, and I got the pulleys, and I got the rope, and I got the tie-off stuff, and I'm all ready, and I hang up this canoe, and it falls right down. <laughs> because our ceiling is not sturdy enough for this canoe. So Amos would have said, you know, that plumb line measure didn't work for you. Plumb line was a measuring tool, and it was a measuring tool for builders to keep things straight. But it becomes a symbol for the prophet Amos of the righteousness of the kingdom. King Jeroboam, one of the many bad kings of Israel, you read through the books of kings, you'll see there are so many kings, and they all get a score in the Bible. The writer of kings, uh, the Deuteronomic historian, he loves to give grades to these kings. This was the worst king who had ever reigned. Well, Jeroboam was in that group of the worst kings who had ever reigned. He was a bad guy. He was not obedient to God. He had built himself a temple. Now, if you look in this reading, it's funny. When the priest, Amaziah, who's got a cushy job, he's running the king's temple. But he scolds Amos. He says, this is the king's temple. Is it really the king's temple? It should be someone else's temple, don't you think? Shouldn't it be God's temple? So you get a clue that this is all about the ego of the king and God is not pleased. And so this plumb line becomes a measuring tool for the righteousness, or in this case, unrighteousness of King Jeroboam and the priest Amaziah and this whole corrupt power structure. Jesus in our gospel has a different kind of plumb line. He meets a lawyer. Now again, the lawyer comes to Jesus and we get a little clue about his motivation. Does he come to learn from Jesus? Does he come to follow Jesus? No, he comes to test Jesus. Now he is not a secular lawyer, he is a religious lawyer. His whole life is dedicated to studying the Jewish law, the first five books of the Bible, which are the Torah, the basis of Jewish faith and life, and he's an expert. He knows all the right answers. In fact, Jesus compliments him when Jesus says, what is the most important commandment? He says, love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, you have the right answer. All that training worked. You know it. It's all up here. But being a lawyer, and no disrespect to lawyers, when we get in trouble, we all want a lawyer, right? They don't get respect until we need them and then we really want them. Well, this uh, lawyer couldn't leave well enough alone. He has to probe further. But, he says, because he still wants to test Jesus, who is my neighbor? Now, he thinks he knows the right answer. The neighbor is the one who also follows the Jewish law, someone who's circumcised, someone who is in the tribe, someone who is doing things right. But Jesus holds up to this man a plumb line. And it's not the same plumb line as Amos. It's not the plumb line of righteousness and perfection. 
It's not the plumb line of condemnation. It is a different plumb line. He tells the man a story. Once upon a time, there was a man who was beaten up and left by the side of the road. For those of us who are in the Holy Land, the road to Jerusalem to Jericho, which loses thousands of feet, it's a very steep road, and it goes through some of the most desolate wilderness I've ever seen in my life. Just total emptiness, a perfect place for robbers and bandits and thieves. So this guy is lying there beaten up, half dead, and guess who comes along? The people who know the right answers. The priest who, like this lawyer, has studied the Jewish law. He knows exactly what he's supposed to do. But has he learned the right lessons? For the priest, life and faith are all about keeping ritual purity. It's about not only doing the right things, but doing them with the right people. To go over to this bleeding man to touch blood would be to become ritually impure. If the man was dead, it would be even worse. The priest cannot afford to lose his purity by going over to this man. How sad it is that this man has been beaten up, but the priest must preserve his purity. Likewise, the Levite, we don't know his motivation, but he also knows all the right answers and similarly avoids this anonymous person. Perhaps the man on the side of the road is a Samaritan. Perhaps he's even worse, a Gentile. We must not associate with the wrong people because we know the right answer. Instead, it is a Samaritan who helps the man out. Famous story. Now the Samaritans, just for a little historical background, were exactly like and descended from the same ancestry as the Jews. Samaritans had the same Bible, at least part of it. The Samaritans had the law, the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They did not, however, believe all the same things. They had the wrong answers about the law, about the Bible. They worshipped in their holy places on the Mount Gerizim instead of worshipping in Jerusalem. And so Jews probably hated Samaritans more even than Gentiles because they were cousins, but they had taken the wrong path and come to the wrong answers. So how shocking it is for this lawyer that Jesus uses the Samaritan as the example of righteousness, of doing the right thing. And he can't escape it. Jesus gives him that twist at the end and says, who was a good neighbor? And he can't, he wants to, but he can't avoid the answer that it was the Samaritan. Dang it, it was the Samaritan. Jesus' plumb line is not a plumb line of knowing the right answers, or even a plumb line of justice and righteousness, as important as those things are, as valid as they are for Amos and for the Bible and for those of us of faith. But Jesus offers us a different plumb line. This is a plumb line not of knowing what is right, but doing what is right. Not a plumb line of having the right answer, but a plumb line of mercy and pity. It is the Samaritan and the Samaritan alone who, when he sees the man on the side of the road, does not see a problem, does not see an outsider or a potential threat to his purity, but whose heart is moved with pity who shows mercy. For Jesus, this is the plumb line that matters, to show mercy and pity, which are synonyms of love. That is the standard for those of us who follow Jesus. And in this world, and again, no disrespect to lawyers, but a world which seems dominated by this kind of legal thinking, 
right and wrong, us versus them, having the right answer and punishing those who do not have the right answer. In this toxic political climate, it is all the more important for us to meditate, to take in this message of Jesus. When I dropped Susan off in Baltimore, she's uh, a deputy from our diocese to the General Convention. And General Convention, uh, Jen has been there before. It can be that same way, right? There are resolutions. Someone makes a resolution. There's debate. Passions get excited on both sides. It can be an adversarial kind of climate. And sometimes, not often, not always, but sometimes we lose the sense of love. That when we look across the other side, do we see a threat? Do we see an enemy? Do we see a stranger? Or do we see a human being worthy of our love? I pray that that's the spirit of the General Convention this week. I pray that that's the spirit that inhabits the leaders of our nation and the leaders of the world, because we are in desperate need of that plumb line of Jesus. We're in danger of being so right that we annihilate the other side who is a part of our own body. It's a kind of suicide to operate in this adversarial way. Instead, may we look across the barriers, the boundaries, the labels, and see in each other beloved children of God. As we follow this Jesus who offers us the plumb line of mercy, who reminds us that the God of justice is the God of mercy, the God who did not destroy us but gave us salvation through his Son, Jesus Christ, who had every reason to condemn us and yet forgave. In his name and for his sake, may we be people of pity and mercy and love.